it's how did somebody sit down and decide the categories for a well-rounded life? Welcome back to the Hard Feelings Podcast. This is, of course, my mental health podcast where we talk about things like anxiety, depression, embarrassment, the desire to be alone, the desire to take extra time for self-care, the desire to do whatever you like. I love that I, like, make myself improvise in the intro when I do not have to. Like, I could write down what I'm gonna say first so I don't lose track of my thought halfway through, but I'm not gonna do that, okay? AKA hard feelings. That is the name of the podcast and that is the thing that we struggle with. We the royal we. We is me, but I think you too because you are listening. Oh my goodness, what a rambly intro already. You guys, I have quite a set of notes for us today. Yeah, you can see there's freaking visuals on there. They look fancier than they are. That's a screenshot from 30 Rock, but I have a lot to talk to you about today. This past week, what's really been weighing heavily on my mind is the pressure to live a well-rounded life. So I had a meeting with my manager earlier in the week and we were talking about different career stuff and whatnot, going through different goals I had within my career. And I said to her after a point, I was like, I just feel like there is so much that I want to do. There are so many different categories within my career, areas that I want to tackle. You know, I'd like to come out with merch at a point. I have like a few ideas for different things that I think would be really cool. And I want to reach out to brands more. I want to make more connections within my industry. I have all of these things that I want to do but then I also have all of these personal goals that I want to achieve and it just feels unachievable. It feels impossible to have it all. You remember that trope in the early 2000s where they loved making movies about, I don't know how she does it. I think that was the name of one. Wasn't that one J-Lo? But just like all of these movies about women who have it all. They have the career and they have the family and you have the success, but they actually don't have romance in their life. So like, that's the spoiler, dude. They don't all have it all. Okay, I guess they do get it all by the end of the movie eventually, but like, that's not reality. But yeah, I've just been really thinking about what a well-rounded life looks like for me lately. And I immediately thought of this scene from 30 Rock where Jack is talking about the, the Six Sigma Wheel of Happiness domination. If you don't watch the show, basically earlier on the show, Jack talks about like how to dominate business and he has this whole wheel. But then later on, he ends up like adapting that wheel to the things that will make him happy. And it has things like philanthropy, hobbies, family, faith, work, hair, arts and leisure, sex and relationships, like that's what's on his wheel of happiness. Um, so that's where my brain went to is like, what would my wheel of happiness look like? I'll give you a more generic example of a wheel like this. This is called the, the life wheel. I think that's what I googled to find it. Um, there's a lot of different variations of this, but they're usually presented in this way where they're all even. And that's where I start to take issue, you know, because I feel like seeing stuff like this all the time and like seeing people in media who like claim to have it all in a very even amounts, um, at least that's the way it's perceived, that just stresses me out because I know my pie chart's not even. I know there's areas of my pie chart right now that the sliver is like, it's, it's like such a small angle, you can barely even see it, you know? And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think at different points in our life, our pie chart will change, you know? So I might be at a part in my life right now where the little wedge for work is like really big. It's like 25% and then things like Arts and leisure are really teeny tiny for me right now. No, but let's, let's be real. I make sure I get my leisure time in. Arts, I don't know, maybe not as much. Although I did see Mitski a couple weeks ago, so that's definitely a tick on the arts and leisure for me. But do I even want that category on my pie chart? That's really like the spiral I was on last night when I was writing these notes. I, as somebody who undiagnosed but very likely has ADHD, I am distracted so easily. So I really have to gamify tasks in order to get them done. Like, I love a to-do list. I love being able to check things off as I go. I love multitasking. I love listening to my audiobook while I work. Like, I need to gamify things. I think that's the phrase that people usually use when talking about, like, ways to make things more doable for people with ADHD. And this little wheel really feels like gamifying life to me. And I don't know if I like that. I think that having something up like this on my wall all the time, it would stress me out so much just like seeing, especially one of the categories they have on this generic one is finances. Why would I want 
want to stare at that on my wall all day. But I do think that it would be a helpful exercise to sit down and think about what my categories might be. You know, using this as an example, just getting inspiration from their categories. Business and career, I will keep that as a category on my chart. Physical environment, that one's interesting by that. I think they mean like where you live, you know, like your house, your city. Your, your town, your street, etc. Fun and recreation, personal growth, romance, family and friends, health. Those are all pretty good, I guess. Finances, I just like clearly have a money thing. I don't like to think about finances often, even though I feel like I feel like I do a decent job of finances. It just stresses me out to think about them sometimes, but yeah. Oh, it's how did somebody sit down and decide the categories for a well-rounded life? And how can I decide my own? Like I'm sitting here being like, let's do this exercise. And then as soon as I actually like start to think about what it would be for me. I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to choose. I don't know how to categorize. You know, the more I look at this one, the more I'm like, dang it. I guess those are good categories. Maybe I just don't like the titles. Maybe I need to change fun and recreation to fun. <laughs> Uh, personal growth. I feel like I just, as again, as an ADHD person, as somebody who really likes long lengthy explanations for something, maybe I'll have to put little descriptions under each category for me that explains what that means. And again, I don't want to hang this up on my wall or anything, but I think a wheel like this could be good to check in every once in a while because I was telling my therapist the other day how I feel like things just come and go through my brain so quickly that if I don't do them right away, I'll I'll forget about them and I'm not a planner person. I don't like using a planner because I forget about it. It doesn't feel natural for me to be constantly checking a planner. I do a daily to-do list that I make the day of sometimes as I go. So the idea of like a chart like this being something I have to adhere to really strictly uh, stresses me out. But I do like the idea of just being reminded of all of these categories and thinking about where do I want to expand? Like for me, I personal growth is an area I want to expand. I think I've been pouring a lot into that wedge of my life, but I, I want it to keep going even more. And another thing that's interesting about like looking at categories like this is how everyone's definition of what fills up one of these categories of a well-rounded life is gonna be different. So I don't think it says it on this one, but on one of the charts it said like socializing, you know, which I guess maybe family and friends is there, but like what counts as socializing to one person might be way too much for another person. And like what's considered a full social wedge for some person might feel like barely even even a tiny sliver to another person because that all comes down to your social battery. I did an episode on this before. Um, I'll try to remember to link it down below. Editing may remember to link it down below. But yeah, I did a whole episode on how everybody's social battery is different. So like another person's social skills, social history, social schedule might seem very different to yours. Like I'm gonna give you an example. I have a friend of mine who is an online friend who I've met in real life and this person goes to events all the freaking time. They're a creator too. They go to like multiple events a day. I saw their story the other day. They did something before work, then met up with a friend at for lunch during work, and they do like a labor intensive job too. And then after work, they met up with another friend and went to a Broadway show. And they do stuff like this a lot. Like they have like a lot of loaded days. They live in New York too, and yet this person and I have very different <laughs> social batteries clearly, because for me, a full day like like that would take me out for weeks. Oh my gosh, if I had a day with that much going on in it, meeting up with multiple people and working a full day and going and seeing a show and like going out to eat, oh, but it's just so much for me. Like when I go to an event anytime, so much of my day is just spent preparing for that event because I know that event is going to take a lot of energy out of me. So it's just interesting to see like different people's social batteries are different. Is this all tying together? What I'm trying to say is that what fills a wedge of your well-rounded life for you might not be the same for somebody else. So I think that's something you really have to consider. The social one is like, obviously I talk all the time about what social anxiety I have. Sometimes I feel this pressure to go to more events than I want to go to just because I feel like I should be socializing. Even if it's something that is not interesting to me, you know, large events 
are not really my vibe. Events that are gonna have a large crowd aside, I'll make exceptions for the Taylor Swift concert, okay? I'll make exceptions for concerts and just like try to pretend there's not a million people around you. But if I can help not going to an event with a ton of people, I will! You know, there's been different influencer and brand events I've gone to and some of them have been like that where it's just a huge sea of people and you're supposed to be mingling and like, hey, that's my nightmare scenario. <laughs> it's not really fun for me. But then I've also been to other events that were very small and intimate and involved people sitting around a table and talking and I loved those! So like for me that's the type of fulfilling social interaction that would fill up my wedge versus the large crowded event that relies on mingling would take a lot of my social battery but it wouldn't really fill too much of that wedge because it wouldn't be fulfilling for me. That's what I think I need to focus on. I'm realizing this in real time as I always do in these episodes. I need to focus on what's fulfilling for each of these categories, not just filling them to fill them. Obviously if you're just going and doing fun things just to fill your fun and recreation category, like if I were to hike up the side of a cliff, I would be freaking terrified and like yeah maybe I'd be proud of myself afterwards, but like I don't think that would be fulfilling for me versus like doing something fun that's like going bowling would be fulfilling for me. I like bowling. That would be, <laughs> that would fill up more of the wedge for me than hiking up the side of a cliff would. So I think you just really have to make sure the things you do choose are fulfilling. You know, quality over quantity. That's something I've been trying to apply to my entire life of experiences. You know, you can have lots and lots of experiences. You can go try every single restaurant in New York City, but I feel like if you focus more on going to the best ones, and I'm not talking about like Michelin star restaurants or like the highest rated restaurants, but the ones that feel best for you, the one that you are most excited about, the one that you looked ahead at the menu and you felt like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what I'm gonna get. It looks so good. Like that will be more fulfilling than trying to hit every single restaurant, you know? And I'm trying to view like social events the same way. I could force myself to go to every single social event I ever get invited to, to try to rack up my social points, or I could go only to the ones that sound exciting to me and feel more fulfilled, you know? And the tough part about that too, as someone with social anxiety, is you have to really think about like, am I, do I not wanna go to this event because I'm anxious about it and I'm nervous that I'm not gonna know what to say, or do I not wanna go to this event because I've gone to a similar event before and it just wasn't my taste, you know? that's the thing I'm working on now. Right now I'm saying yes to most events and going to them just to get uh, a roster of what I like and don't like. If Hey, if you have social anxiety, I think that's a good way of thinking of trying new things, is saying like, okay, I'm curious, I'm trying new things, I'm gonna try this thing one time and if I hate it, I'm gonna leave early and never do it again. That's something, a little social anxiety hack for you guys that I always remind myself of, um, because my therapist sent it to me once, is that like, you can go to a social event that you're nervous about and if you get there and it's really horrible and you're not having any fun, just stay for 15 minutes and leave. No one is forcing you to stay anywhere. You're not in school anymore. Like nobody's gonna grab you and take you to the principal's office if you try to leave early. Like don't skip out on your bill, okay? If you're meeting people for dinner, don't skip out on your bill. But like, you know, no one's forcing you to stay anywhere. And I sometimes get into this mode where I go to social events where my body is reacting like I am walking in to the safari and there is a bunch of lions. But that's not the case when I'm going to creator events. There's no lions there just beautiful people. Um, so yeah, good, good little reminder to give yourself. <laughs> oh, another section I wanted to focus on that the generic wheel I found didn't include, but Jack Donaghy's did include, is hobbies. That is one area where I really want to put more focus into because I pick up, you know, ADHD. I pick up new hobbies all the time and I get bored of them very quickly. Knitting is one that every winter I get really excited about and then I make one thing and then I get bored of it. But I do need to find like a seasonal hobby. Not that knitting is seasonal, but for me it is. I don't know. I really want to learn how to crochet so I can make myself cute little crop tops and stuff, but I always get too overwhelmed by learning how to crochet. That's the thing with hobbies that I think stresses me out sometimes is that I feel like, oh, I need to learn a brand new thing and I have to be good at it right away. I can't 
be bad in the beginning. I have to be good immediately. Obviously, I know this is not true, but that's what my brain tells me. I get very discouraged when I'm not good at something immediately. I started one of those woobles, you know, those little crochet animals my boyfriend got me last year. I started the cat one, and I got like a quarter of the way through it, and then I had to start switching colors, and I was like, this is too hard. It's supposed to be relaxing, which like there is no rule that your hobby has to be easy and relaxing, but I think I wanna add more things into my hobby category that are just easy and relaxing. Like, I wanna start doing puzzles again. I tried doing, I tried getting into puzzling last summer and I bought a really cheap one and the pieces wouldn't stick together, so obviously that was really frustrating and I never finished it. I got really into diamond art last year too. That's like where they give you like, you know, a pre, colored painting, I guess, painting. I, they give you a picture, okay? And it's sticky and you gotta stick the little diamond pieces onto it. It's kind of like paint by numbers, but it's like little diamonds and they stick to the thing and it's not numbers. You just match the colors. That was wonderful. I like a hobby that you don't have to think too hard about. That's the thing. And knitting can be like that. You know, like I knit myself a scarf this winter and that was lovely to work on because you know, I'm just knitting and doing other things, knitting and watching TV, knitting and listening to my audiobooks. <laughs> knitting and listening to music. Like, I love a hobby that is easy enough to multitask with. My boyfriend and I have also been playing chess lately. I don't know if that's a hobby. Um, I'm not very good at it because I have no strategy and I haven't tried to learn. That's the thing. I don't always want to be educated when it comes to a hobby. I think just because I'm burnt out. I think just because I'm tired. That's what it is. If I had more energy, maybe I could. How can I think of ways to give myself more energy? I'm sure I could try being less hard on myself and that would probably help. That's kind of what my therapist um, and I have been talking about lately is that I'll tell her like I give myself a hard time about sleeping in in the morning because I work for myself and like don't have to be up at a certain time so like I don't get up at 6 a.m. every morning like these people with perfect morning routines do online and then like I start my day with a walk. I go outside first thing and I take my coffee with me and I really enjoy it and I listen to my book and then like sometimes I'll come inside and feel really bad about it afterwards like multiple times throughout the day. I'll think like, wow, you're really unorganized. Like this, you do not work hard enough in a day. You are never gonna make enough money doing this job, even though like I currently am, but I tell myself like, you're getting away with it right now. You're just getting lucky. Um, and because you don't work hard enough, nothing's gonna turn out for you. And my therapist was like, that is like, so energy draining and she was telling me how like wonderful it is to walk first thing in the morning because it does give you energy you know exercise gives you endorphins even though i'm not out there like jogging or anything but you know i i get to moving in my crocs but like that is such a wonderful energy inducing thing that gives you energy and gives you the focus to be able to go work do work when you get home but she said like i'm basically sabotaging myself by like get myself revved up doing that exercise, getting those endorphins, and then beating myself up afterwards. And like, that was pretty mind blowing to me. I was like, oh wow, yeah, what a wasteful thing to do. Because yeah, when I don't beat myself up afterwards and just allow myself to go on these nice walks, I feel such a burst of creativity. Half the podcast ideas that I have on here were developed on a walk. Um, like that's just where ideas come to me when I'm allowing my head to be clear. So why, why should I beat myself up for doing things differently? If you also work for yourself or have an unusual sort of job that is not like like a nine to five, that doesn't mean you're not working hard. You know, it's all about the value of energy. Like obviously, you know, I talk to some people who work nine to five office jobs that say they have a lot of free time during the day once they get their work done. So they're not necessarily working eight hours either, but because they're in an office, I think they're working so much harder than I am than sitting here in the corner of my bedroom. But in reality, I don't know that. And I think I work plenty hard. So I'm gonna try to be nicer to myself so I can have more energy to do the things that make me happy. All right, it's time for the mental health bop of the week. And this week's bop is a bossa nova hit. I mentioned last week that I'm really into Astrid Gilberto right now, who like is an international bossa nova superstar, best known for being the girl from Ipanema. Like that is her voice. Um, I could give you so much trivia on her right now because naturally I've read her Wikipedia page top to bottom and I'd love to learn more. But instead I will just advise you to go 
listen to her album Look to the Rainbow. Um, I, re I really like Look to the Rainbow and I like the Astrid Gilberto album too that has Aqua de Baber on it which is really good. A lot of it's in Portuguese. I love that. I was talking about last week how I love listening to these Bossa Nova hits because it's more about the vibe for me. I mean, some of these, don't get me wrong, some of these songs, lyrically, the ones that are in English that I can understand um, are pretty crazy. I really like the song Maria Quiet. It's a Women's History Month bop. It is incredible. I love that one. Um, and I like looking up the Portuguese um, phrases in the song sometimes and finding out. I now know that the term lugar bonito means pretty place, so that's really cool. Um, I am also learning Portuguese, but I just, you know, told myself I wasn't going to talk about the trivia and all of the reasons I love Astrid so much. But the vibes of her music just have been soothing me in a way I don't understand. You know what? I am going to pause and find out if there is any science to what Bossa Nova does for my psyche. Okay, I couldn't find any science, but somebody asked this question on Reddit three years ago, and our pal Doug Ditzel says, Bossa Nova is great. Mellow nylon, string guitar, a soft rhythm, almost whispered vocals, even though it's soft and mellow. It never gets boring since the chord progressions are fairly complex. Wow. Oh my gosh. And then he says, rumor is is that the music was born in small apartments in Rio where the noise level had to be kept down. And then he told me I should watch a documentary film called This Is Bossa Nova, and I will, and I will, Doug. Oh my goodness. So that's not a sign, you know, we don't even know if Doug's a real rock musician, although I am inclined to trust him. But I have to agree that Bossa Nova never gets boring, and it just makes you feel really good. And it's not like, sometimes, you know, I'm a lyrics girly. Like, I like to know the lyrics to songs. That's why I love Taylor Swift. I love how lyrically involved she is. And not that there aren't still some, like, very complex lyrics in some of these songs, but Bossa Nova is a feeling, man. Feel free to quote me on that. Bossa Nova is a feeling. Um, it is also a genre of music but for me it is a feeling. <laughs> it makes me feel really relaxed. I love putting it on while I do other things. I love putting it on when I walk outside. It just feels like it matches the rhythm of the outside really well. Same way as jazz. You know, bossa nova is like a subgenre of jazz, I think. I don't know. I gotta go watch that documentary to learn more about bossa nova. But that is your assignment this week. I don't have any song in particular. You just have to listen to any of Astrid Gilberta's um, songs because they're so good. All right, everybody. And with that, we've reached the end of the episode. Another rambly one for the books. My makeup's pretty wild today. If you're not watching, come on over to YouTube or just go check my Instagram. I'm sure I'll have something with this look on it. But yeah, I did two different eye looks, two different graphic liner looks on each eye um, with the same colors tied up together with a little uniliner, which was created by Adults Drink on Instagram and TikTok. Uh -huh. I love it. I love it. I really like the way it turned out. The colors are inspired by my Bobby Hill earrings, which I got from at folksy love on Instagram um, or folksy love is the name of her website. I'll try to remember to put all the details down below if you're interested. And I thank you so much for listening to yet another episode of the Hard Feelings podcast. Subscribe, follow, do all the things. I'll have a link to more episodes down below if you want to catch up. This is like my 32nd episode, dude. So I got, I got a whole catalog for you to listen to. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next Friday. Bye. Take care of yourself.